This morning, God was reminding me of that first book that I wrote that he had me scrap. Because really, the reason I wrote that book, I didn't know this at the time, but he was cleaning me up. I had no understanding of these concepts of speaking on the world's authority versus God's authority or the authority of the one who sent you. As he speaks about in John 7, everyone's amazed at his wisdom and Jesus answers them, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. And that's the authority that we speak on. But when I was writing that first book, God would was indeed healing me. I mean, he would wake me up. I would sit with him. He would convict me. I would examine myself. I would examine myself with him. I would repent. I would bear the fruit of repentance, which is change, and I would begin to heal. And so I was writing about what it was that God was doing with me. But then my worldly training, my academic training in particular, was so ingrained in me that I needed to you know, I needed to have evidence-based stuff, which is a bunch of nonsense, by the way. Evidence-based stuff didn't do anything for me when I was sick. It's a bunch of nonsense. I had to have stuff that had been done before, tried and tested, a bunch of nonsense. I was doing all that, the best money could buy. None of it healed me. But something inside of me knew that people weren't going to take it seriously. I wouldn't have been able to articulate it at that time, but something inside of me knew people were not going to take it seriously, that I had to go by the rules of the world. So I wrote that book, and I wrote that book for about a year and a half, I believe. Then I sent it off to an editor and paid an editor to edit it, which of course I've taken up with God, a self-proclaimed Christian who was being given an opportunity to speak the truth to me, if indeed he had any truth, and he didn't. There was so much pagan nonsense in that book. By the time I got it back, God had already let me know that I was to scrap the book, that I was now going to write a book that was going to be a very different kind of book. And I remember that as I was writing that book and remaining with God's spirit and his word alone, I would send little excerpts to my daughter and my son-in-law and my daughter would tell me, this is clear. This is clear. The, ba the last book was not clear. Too much confusion. You can't take what God's doing, even if he's genuinely doing this with you, and then mix it in with the world. It's mixing that clay and iron, two materials that cannot adhere to each other. You just destroyed it. And God reminded me about these treatments that I was receiving. I would drive like 50 miles, 50 miles to go see this quacky doctor who was doing like energy healing or something like that. He was a chiropractor and he would let you know what was deficient in your body. Then he'd sell you a bunch of supplements. And, you know, I was so desperate after having gone to medicine. And don't, don't ask me why I didn't go to this doctor or that. I did. I went to every doctor, specialists, naturopaths. I went to every doctor, infectious disease, the best money could buy. By this time, I was desperate. And I remember that he had me buy all of this stuff, like $500 worth of stuff, not to mention the gas it took to get to him, the $300 visit, all of the supplements. By the time I was done with the visit, I had at least $1,000 worth of new stuff to take, new nonsense to try. And I remember he had me buy like $500 worth of stuff and blend it up and eat it in a smoothie. And it was killing my stomach. And I told him, this is really hurting my stomach. I'm sick from this. And he said, ah, just stop taking it. And I'm thinking like, oh, it's that easy? So like, this isn't even that important. It's just like we're throwing stuff against a wall. Just stop taking it. What shall I do with the $500 worth of junk that I now have? I was doing foot soaks and baths that were supposedly detoxing my body. Here's the thing. Here's the reason I'm sharing this with you. 
We have done so many stupid things in the world for healing. We would rather believe that a stone or a crystal has some sort of energetic properties to reset the energy in our bodies. And also, like, if a stone could affect the energy in your body, how do you know if it's affecting it for good? Oh, no, but let's sleep with it in our pillowcase. We would rather believe all of this stupid stuff, the frankincense that we're diffusing into the air, the sage that we're cleansing our homes with. We'll believe in all of that over the sovereignty of God. No, the sovereignty of God to people who've come on this channel is offensive. That's offensive to people. It's a destructive teaching that God is sovereign and that he sends certain things when we sin and that we have to return to him in order to be healed. That's what his word says. That's offensive to people. It's a destructive teaching to them. It's offensive to people that we would need to suffer for the name, separate from the lives we've been living, the desires of our flesh. It's offensive that we're not just waiting here for God to pick us up, but that we're actually working out a covenant, a contract with him in which he fulfilled his part. Now we're fulfilling ours. These things are offensive and destructive to those calling themselves Christian. And it's not as though I don't live what I'm speaking to you. I live it first, then I speak it to you. That's how God established that. That's what it means when you're a witness and you're sharing your testimony. You got to have one in order to share it. This covenant's not easy. And Jesus warned us that it wouldn't be, that we don't get to go and outsource our responsibilities to other people, abdicate personal responsibility and accountability over to a doctor, a pill, a treatment, that we're actually going to suffer for his name, the thing he's doing, his will, that we have to return to him and seek him first and single-mindedly. God's teachings are offensive and upsetting to people. Back when I was practicing psychology, I would speak at different events about neurocognition, trauma, and people would show up and they would take notes and they would email me and they were fully engaged and they would ask questions. Everyone's in a hurry to gather the information of the world, but God's teachings are offensive. They're foolish. Those calling themselves Christian when confronted with the teachings that are actually in the word of God, act like, yeah, but you don't really believe all that, do you? But God gave us science, but God gave us doctors, but God gave us, he gave that to you as a stumbling block to see if you would actually believe in him or the world's expertise. He gave those things to you in order to test your heart. Like when he says in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord who heals you. If you obey everything that I've commanded, I'm not going to put on you any of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians. Are you going to think, yeah, but you gave us science. The fact that people have a narrative about illness being a victimization is completely contrary to the word of God. God tells you why he sends illness and God tells you, yes, that he sends it. And that if you repent and turn from your wicked ways, that he will heal you. And Jesus said, repent, or something worse is going to happen to you. So when did these things change? Because what I see are a bunch of people who don't love truth. People who relish in falsehood. And when they're confronted with the word of God are offended. They think it's a destructive teaching. They think that something has changed, that there are separate rules for Jews versus Christian. Hello? The first Christians were Jews. The fulfillment of Judaism is Christianity because Jews had been promised a Messiah. And then when the Messiah came, they became Christian. There's no difference between true Judaism and Christianity. I've been on this channel over three years. And as a witness, I have been serving, t serving you for two and a half years. Yesterday was the two and a half year marker. Today begins the year countdown before I die. I've written two books, one regarding my testimony, which is what the witnesses share, my testimony both of how God healed me and what he has spoken with me about regarding the deception in the world right now and what his word actually says, an attempt to call you in and get you to look at what you've been taught and what the word actually says. I've written another book to help you to understand 
how to live out this covenant based on what the word says, not based on some goofy so-called healing ministry where you're like, repeat these words, a rule for this and a rule for that, a little here, a little there. Repeat this prayer. Leviathan, Jezebel, come out of her. Those aren't things in the Bible, guys. That's not reality. What is being taught to you right now is not reality. What has been taught for many, many years has distorted the truth in the word. God's word says return to him. It does not say reform. It doesn't say add to the scroll. In fact, those who do those things are not going to make it. They are accursed. I've shared my testimony with you about how God had to bring me to the brink of death in order to get my attention because of my sin. I've shared with you about the trauma and the very difficult start at life that I had. And I've also shared with you that God sent those things and that he requires me to be built by them. I did not have PTSD. God has not assigned a bunch of syndromes to us. He has given us consequences when we are not receiving his ministry. And because I didn't return to him, I had consequences. Because I went and took pills and went to therapies and things like that, I had consequences. Because what does God say? He says, I am the Lord who heals you. Return to me. Turn from your wicked ways. Humble yourselves. Repent. He didn't say, go to this expert and that expert so that they can take, they can take your burdens for you. They can tell you the narrative of what's happened in your life. You can't receive why those things have happened and what to do with them if you don't go to the one who sent them and who is sovereign over it. I've shared this testimony with you for the last two and a half years as a witness. I've tried to call you in. I've poured myself out to emotional exhaustion and to exhausting all of my financial resources, everything that I had, not have, had, because I don't have anything anymore. I've given it for the name. I've given it for what I'm doing with God. Do you know anyone who's done that? Anyone who gave up their retirement and their savings and their child's inheritance, their properties, their careers, in order that they would give freely what's been given to them and be able to give it at no cost. Well, actually, at their own cost. Because this is what God's servants do. I've been warning you about judgment. I spoke a message to you before the Asheville hurricane happened that God was getting ready to overflow your hiding place. And it's not just about Asheville, but that's a sign to you of the destruction that God is going to bring. I've been telling you for many months that God is going to bring sword, famine, wild beast, and plague, and that next year the Antichrist is going to rise. This is what he's requiring me to speak today. If you've noticed, I have not posted a video for many days now because I have been in such a position of lowliness and brokenness that I can hardly whisper from the ground. I mean, I don't even know what to say to you about the suffering that I've been experiencing. But I am at a point right now of having given everything to the point of being in foreclosure. Even if I were to squat here, I don't have any money to live as far as utilities, as far as anything. But I know that God has brought me here and I know that I am at this point where I am being required to be used as an offering for him to reveal his glory. And I don't really enjoy telling you that because I know that people are going to have their own judgments about it. And yet God's been known to create impossible situations so that his glory can be revealed. And even in this situation, I was telling you that I had a $1,000 in my account, $1,000. Well, do you know that about a week ago, a company direct debited all the money I had to live on? And I know darn well I'm never going to see that money again. And yet, what do we do? We go back to God. If, we, if indeed we're his children, we go back to him and we ask him, 
Okay, that was all the money I had to live on. What are you doing with me? What are you teaching me? What are you showing me? Use me for your purpose, Lord. Use me for your name. Something's going to happen, guys. I don't know what. I hardly want to talk about this. Because as strong as my voice may sound, I don't feel strong. I feel broken. I know what I've done. I know what I'm doing. I know what God has done. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> but I know that he's real. And I know the things that he has told me. I know the things that his word says. That I am to seek first the kingdom of heaven. And that he will take care of me. That he knows the things that I need. I know that every day and every morning when I get up, the first thing I have to do is examine myself, do my personal accountability work, and then bring myself to God. And I know that I've done that and that he has to make a way. And the only reason I'm sharing this with you is so that you will believe. So that when he does what he's going to do, you will believe. Because this is not a possible situation. This is an impossible situation. There are no other options besides God. And he's been known to do that, hasn't he? Because he says in his word, then you're going to know that I am the Lord. So I'm sharing this with you because people have all kinds of weird ideas about this covenant and what they're required to suffer or not suffer. Usually it's not suffer because they put everything on, oh, Jesus did all that. He paid it all. But I'm here to tell you that when Jesus said that this was a narrow road, narrow path, narrow door, that it's difficult for the righteous to be saved, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for, than for a rich man to be saved. When he said all that, he was not saying, so I'm going to go ahead and pay it all for you. And when he said that with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. What he was saying is God knows how to bring you there. Not God is going to hand this over to you. He knows how to bring you into a position of such brokenness that you can finally be saved with the sacrifice of Christ. He knows how to bring you to an impossible situation so that your faith is tested to such a point that you are going to live out. You are going to prove whether or not you're going to stand in that moment or you're going to turn back. And I want you to know we've had a lot of people join us. And a lot of people leave because they couldn't stand in simple things, simple things like I'm more afraid of my boss than I am of God. I'm not going to take God's Sabbath off because I don't trust him. I don't trust him or believe that he can make a way. I've seen three people do that, actually do it. Others who caved in and demonstrated that they really don't believe in God. I've seen multiple people not be willing to bear their family, to continue to come to Sabbaths and assemblies while never mentioning the husband they had at home, the kids they had at home, the kids that they completely abandoned, never hearing them even talk about that, but thinking, oh, I'm so saved. What? How can you be saved? How can you be being saved if you're not being moved by the Spirit of God to walk in the trust that he gave you. How are you going to be able to handle the things that I'm telling you about that God has me doing? How are you going to be able to handle that next year when the Antichrist rises and you're placed in a position to be tested? Because that's what God says in Revelation 3, that he's sending something to the inhabitants of the earth to be tested. How are you going to stand in that test if you can't do minor things, how are you going to be a priest of God and serve him in his house for a thousand years if you're not even serving in the house he gave you here? Does anybody receive a promotion when they're not doing a basic job at the bottom? How? How would you receive a promotion? How would you be trusted with more? Doesn't God say... That when you do well with the little he gave you, then you receive more, and then you receive more, and then you receive more? Is his word in your heart or not? I don't want to share this testimony with you because it's too vulnerable. But I sorted it out. I wrestled with my own feelings about it. And God's always going to win out. 
I'm always going to do what he's telling me to do. But I'm going to tell you right now, I hardly have enough strength to keep going or to share this message with you. But when he tells me to do something, I muster it up and I expect that he's going to give me what I need in order to share the message. I work in my heart until I'm able to get to where I can obey every single thing that he has told me to do, not some of it. There was a counterfeit Christian that was with us at one time who said, oh, well, you can say no to God. No, you cannot. You cannot say no to God. If you're not ready to do it right now, then use this time to get yourself there. I shared with you previously that God told me to get rid of my fancy shoes in the closet. It was very difficult for me. I pulled those shoes out. I set them on the console and I sorted it through with God. And I said, Lord, I am not, my heart is not there yet. This is really, really hard for me. This was earlier on. Please bring my heart there. And I don't think it took more than between night to morning for him to bring my heart there. Lots of journaling and sorting through what those shoes even meant to me. What, what did they mean to my identity? I worked really hard to get to where I was. And then God said, this isn't of me. Am I going to turn back for a stupid pair of shoes that I can't, I don't even have it. Where would I even wear them? Where would a godly person go to wear some fancy shoes, guys? Nowhere. There can't be any flesh left in you. Daniel 12 says that these, Jesus said to Daniel in Daniel 12, that these things, these tribulations are going to continue until the power of God's holy people has been broken. Well, guess what? We don't have any power. The only power that we have ever thought that we had was in our flesh. That's what he's talking about. Your flesh is going to be broken. That's where you're going to be brought. And the only reason I can understand that is because of what God's doing in me. Because I'm here to live this out in front of you. And to share my testimony, I'm put on display, made a spectacle, just as Paul said, in order that you might know what this looks like, because you don't have any shepherds who are showing you what this looks like. Not at this point in history. They're all a bunch of liars living in their mega churches and their mega mansions, telling you some mega lies. I'm sharing this testimony with you because I care more about your salvation, and God's house than about my own comfort. I care about you watching and keeping vigil for God's glory. I care about saving my soul, not my face. I care about the future that I have in Christ. I care about my eternal life, not this temporary one. And if you want to be saved, that's where your heart is going to have to be brought. Please discern this message with God.